Good evening and welcome. And thank you for joining us for our 43rd annual dinner. I uh, must start with a happy Mother's Day wish to all the mothers in the room. And uh, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker, and we'll do the remainder of the program afterwards. This is our second opportunity in the shul to have Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson speak for us. The first was at our C. Mishnayos a few years back, and he was as entertaining, informative, and inspiring as always. Rabbi Jacobson is at this point one of the most sought-after speakers in the Jewish world, Orthodox and non-Orthodox alike. He speaks to Jews, to non-Jews, to audiences of all stripes, all colors, and all types. And uh, he has a gift for connecting to his audience, for knowing exactly what they need to hear, and presenting in a way that's both enjoyable, informative, often humorous, and always articulate, and broad, and deep. Rabbi Jacobson is the founder and dean of the Shivanet. He is the longtime editor of the Aldermeyer Journal, a uh, spiritual leader of Congregation Beis in New York. That was a former position. Uh, he grew up and studied at the feet of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And uh, when the community here in Rockland County at large in the JCC wanted to find a speaker who could appropriately respond to the events of Pittsburgh of this past October, they needed somebody whom everybody could relate to and who could relate to everybody and they wisely chose Ray Jacobson. It is a pleasure, a privilege, and an honor for me to introduce to you our guest speaker this evening, Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson. Thank you, thank you very Some time ago there was a dinner and the master of ceremonies introduced Senator Joseph Lieberman to the podium and he extolled his virtues ad infinitum, following which Senator Lieberman gets up and he says, it's a pity that my parents are not here this evening. My father would have appreciated these words. My mother would have believed them. A pity my parents are not here this evening. I just spoke to my mother and she believes this and much more. <laughs> they tell an anecdote about a Jew who came from the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. He came from a city called Pinsk. Pinsk is a city in Belarus, Lithuania, depends who won the war that Monday. And he made it over to the United States of America. There was one issue. In Pinsk, he came from a family of poverty. Dire poverty. In America, he decided it's a new country. He wants to turn a new page and open a new chapter in his life. He wants to be a respectable person. So he borrowed money. He bought himself a designer suit, an elegant hat, exquisite shoes, came into the shul and decided he's not going to sit in the back. He's going to sit right in the front, front row Mizrach with the prominent individuals, and he's going to display a demeanor, an ear, and halo of prominence and distinction. But how will people get to know him? And he realized he has a good idea. When the Gabbai asks if there's a Koyan, he'll say he's a Koyan. The moment you're a Koyin, you're always getting aliyahs, people know your name, Shkoyach, Shkoyach, they give you honors, benching, oh, there's Koyanim here. Gewaldik, <laughs> yeah, Shkoyach Koyin, Shkoyach Koyin. 
you're already elevated. You don't have to do anything else. Vikidashto, this week's parsha. Vikidashto, you're holy. Great. Sits down in the front. Looks beautiful. He's finally going to metamorphosize himself from the state of a shlamazl and a shlamil and a bottle and a kapsen into a prominent Jew. And before the reading of the Torah, the Gabba says, Koyin, Koyin, yeah, I'm a Koyin. Gets an aliyah, I'm a Chaya. What a pleasure. Comes down, everybody is greeting him. No, good beginning. After davening, everybody goes by the rabbi. The sacred Shabbos. His turn, he goes by the rabbi. The rabbi looks at him. Yanko? Yanko? Pins? Yeah. Wow! Bruchim aboyim! Baruch mechaya hameisim! What a joy! You made it over! Amazing! A big kiss, a big hug. But the uncle, I have a question. I remember you in Pinsk. I remember your father. I remember your Zayd al Shalom. When I was a kid, I remember your great-grandfather. Good Jews, fine people, but not Koyanim. Where in the world did you become a how in the world did you become a Koyan? Yanka looks at the rabbi and some things you just have to say it in Yiddish and then I'll translate it. Those who understand Yiddish understand Yiddish, those who I will translate. He says, listen, Rabbi, this is America. As I can sein a rov, can ich sein a koyen? This is America. You can be a rov, I can be a koyen. That's how it works. Right? The rabbi was quiet. He was quiet. The board never found out. The rest is history. In some situations, I guess the anecdote is appropriate. <laughs> I'm privileged here this evening to address you at this 43rd dinner of one of the most ancient institutions here in Rockland County in Muncie, one of the great pillars, one of the great shuls. And I know that over the years, some of you have watched Muncie go through, like in Kafka's novel, a metamorphosis. Let's put it from good to good and from good to better. And you have watched communities develop, different cultures blossom, and yet this shul remains, remain and remains an anchor of such a large, diverse, non-judgmental, beautiful community under the exceptional spiritual guidance first of Rabbi Wein, Rabbi Haber, and now under the skilled, exquisite, and powerful and invigorating leadership of Rabbi and Rabbi Gottlieb Schlitten, and the entire leadership, membership of the shul, the women and the men. And it's truly a privilege, it's truly a privilege to be here with you on this great celebration like every shul and every institution goes through stages, easier days and more difficult days. Last time I was here on a snow, I was in the shul, there was a huge snow. It was, a, I don't know, a foot and a half. Some people thought nobody will show up, but there was a show. Today I come and the sun is shining. That's how things go in every institution, every family, in every shul. And yet steadfastly you maintained your name, your dignity, your mission statement, your unwavering commitment and dedication to the community, every one of its members, and develop generations with true Yiddish and Nachas and Jewish identity. And when I look around at this shul and I have the privilege of knowing some of you and hopefully in the future knowing more of you, I think about three things that distinguish it. Number one has to do with unity, camaraderie, community. You know, they say that Yaakov, when he went out and he had his dream, remember he had his dream and he took the stones, he took the stones, and at the end there was one stone, and Rashi says that the stone started to fight. Which part of the stone is going to get his head? And then he wakes up and he says, This is a house of God, this is a shul. How did he know this is a shul? And the answer is, if even the rocks could get into a fight. 
if even the stones start fighting, this is Ein Zeki in Beisalakim. This only could be in a shul. Even the wolves get into fights at board meetings and so forth. You know, in Hebrew you say Shalom Aleichem, and the answer is Aleichem Shalom. Which I always wondered why the opposite response. Imagine in English, I say good evening, and you say evening good. How are you? You are how? What's up? Up what? You think I'm a shiga, but in Hebrew we do it all the time. Shalom Aleichem. Instead of saying Shalom Aleichem, you say Aleichem Shalom. And the answer is that in the Jewish language, when two Jews meet, even before they get into the conversation, the first thing is they have to disagree. I say Shalom Aleichem, you say, nah, Aleichem Shalom. Once we establish that there's an argument, now we can have a peaceful conversation. There's a fellow, Jackie Mason, a great Kabbalist. He's the guy, he's the guy who repeats a lot of my jokes. So I once heard from him that if two Jews meet and within three minutes they don't establish a family connection, one of them is not Jewish. Yeah, my grandmother was your sister-in-law's first cousin. You know how it is always, you meet somebody in the airport from Japan, but it's your cousin, it's your relative, yeah? I go to Australia, you say, oh, you're from New York? You must know my cousin. Of course I know your cousin, and there's only three million Jews there. Why wouldn't I know your cousin? We eat herring together. But I would say if two Jews meet them within four or five minutes, they don't get into an argument, probably one of them should undergo a conversion, at least l'chumra. Shalom Aleichem, Aleichem, Shalom. But when you see a place, truly non-judgmental, that everybody calls home, and I know the shul has so many different types of people in terms of background and persuasion, and perhaps different traditions, and levels of commitment to Yiddishkeit and so forth, but a place of so much camaraderie. I spoke to one of the members of the shul today and I asked, what distinguishes your shul? I, it was a woman because they always know things better than men, especially on Mother's Day. So, uh, she said, <laughs> the women agree, we need the men to applaud. <laughs> it's fine, you'll applaud afterwards. And she said, in our shul, there's no divisiveness, there's no fragmentation, there's camaraderie, there's brotherly and sisterly love. Pasuk says, What's gam yochad? You know what's, what's gam yochad? I know for the song it works. But he could have gone. What's gam yochad? Also together? When brothers and sisters sit together, it's good and beautiful. What's gam yochad? So the <laughs> gam yochad is, gam yochad is an acronym. Yesh chiluke deus. When there's different opinions, Hine Matovim Anoyim Shevet Achim Gam, even Yacha, people have sometimes different perspectives, but brothers and sisters can sit together because we're one. The other day I got a call from Rabbi J.J. Schechter, professor in Yeshiva University. Some of you remember his father, Rabbi Heschel Schechter from the Bronx, chaplain who liberated Buchenwald in 1935, who had the, the honor to know. And Rabbi J.J. Shechter shared with me, he said he was in Israel. And he met a fellow in Israel by the name of Aryeh Eldad. Aryeh Eldad has a very interesting job. He travels to Israeli high schools, to the senior graduating class, to help them acclimate to the realities of the army when they turn 18. I need not explain to this audience that when a lot of our kids turn 18, and go on doing things that 18 year olds do. In Israel there's an obligatory draft and it's not easy for a 17 year old to know next year he's going to the army. So Eldad goes literally, travels and speaks to these teenagers to empower them, to inspire them, to listen to their fears, concerns, especially some of them in various communities, especially secular Israeli communities who are really, it's very hard for them. And Ariel Dad shared and he said, there was one particular class of seniors who were truly uninterested. It was such a foreign concept to them. And I worked with them over a few months. And always the last thing I do with these kids is I take them to Har Herzl. And I took this group to Har Herzl, where of course you have prime ministers buried and leaders buried, but thousands of soldiers buried. And I'm sure some of you have been there. You have a section for 1948, Independence War, section for 1956, 
a section for 1967, a section for 1973, a section for 1982, and so on and so forth, all the way to the last Gaza War, 2014. Now I should say the second to the last Gaza War, 2014. In the section of 1948, we're looking around, and suddenly they see a grave, and it catches their eye because of its uniqueness. It has a day of a yard site. It has the name of a platoon. It has the serial number of the soldier and the name of the platoon, the number of the platoon, the group. But it doesn't have the name. Instead of the name, it says, Poimitman Almoini. Almoini means the anonymous one. The anonymous one. So the boys turn to Arya Elda, then they say, Mazev al Mazev. They buried somebody, a soldier didn't know his name. Nobody knew the soldier's name to engrave on a tombstone a year later, they couldn't figure out his name. Almoni, the anonymous one. You know when he died, where he died, how he died, which platoon he was in. Can't you speak to his commander? And Arya says, Boys, I'll tell you the story of this Almoni. He was a survivor of the Holocaust. He lost his entire family. He came up on one of the illegal boats to what was then called Palestine under the British mandate. He made it into the land, to the Holy Land. And they told him, we are under siege by seven Arab armies in a war for our very existence. Here is a gun. They gave him a gun. They drafted him immediately as he landed. The following day, he fell in battle. Famous battle of Castile on the road to Jerusalem, where I think 70, 70 of our boys were killed in one day. And he was one of them. As they buried him, they realized the double tragedy. He was killed. Nobody knew who he was. He just came. There were no papers, there was no registration. His comrades in the platoon, who may have known his name from yesterday, were all killed. They couldn't find out a name. On him they wrote, al the anonymous one. And he sees that these boys are very moved, they're crying. And they turn to him and they say, Arye, who says Kaddish for this boy? Who commemorates his yard site? Who remembers him? Ari said, nobody could remember his yard site or say Kaddish, there's no family. See, even today with DNA, we can do a DNA test, but who are we going to try to match it up with? Who? His relatives were killed in the Holocaust. There's 6.6 .6 million Jews in Israel. What are we supposed to do with his DNA? We don't know where to begin. The boy said, can we say Kaddish for him? He said, of course. They said a Kaddish. The boys say, how can such a thing happen? And Arya Eldad says, I'll explain to you boys. All these Jews who were saved from the Holocaust and came here to the Holy Land knew one thing. That in 1938, when nations met in Evian in France to discuss the fate of the Jewish people, because initially Hitler didn't want to exterminate the Jews. He wanted to expel them. But nobody was ready to take them in. There was no place in the world that they could call home. And when they came here, they wanted one place that they could call home. And they took a gun, and they were ready to fight for it. And he was killed immediately. So today, we'll commemorate him. They went home. They were drafted to the army. A year later, Arye Eldad gets a call from one of the boys. Atazoherati, you remember me? Of course I remember you. From the rebellious bunch. What do they call in America? The dirty dozen? The tough bunch? He says, Arye, you know that today is the yard site of Almoni on the tombstone. We remember today is the yard site of the anonymous soldier. He says, I didn't know. That's so nice that you remember it. Aye! Matsanu et We found his family. 
Estelle Dead says, you're crazy. You didn't find this family. It's been gone for more than 70 years. There's no way to begin to find this family. You don't have what to work with. What? I'm telling you, we found this family. Today, the yard side, the family is coming to the grave to say Kaddish for him and to learn Mishnayas and to give charity and to study Torah and do a mitzvah in the honor of his soul. He says, what are you talking about? You're hallucinating. Just come to the grave and you'll see the family will be there. He goes to the grave. Who's standing around the grave? He takes a look. It's all those teenagers whom he vi visited this place a year ago. And they say these words, Aryeh, matzanu et ha-mishpacha shalo, anachnu ha-mishpacha shalo. We found his family. We are his family. So we came to say Kaddish on the day of his yard site. He's our family. This is our family, mishpacha shalo. And when I heard this, I understood the power of the Jewish people. Not just, not just horizontally, but also vertically. Not just horizontally in one generation, but vertically throughout all of the generations. What those teenagers understood. So many of us older Jews, and I should say sometimes in the very religious community, could learn. He's not Almoni, he's not anonymous. He's our brother. He's our sister. I'm sad to see that often this consciousness does not pervade all segments of our society. I know subconsciously it always does, but on a conscious level, sometimes we lose focus of this truth that our brutal enemies understand always and never make that mistake of distinguishing and saying this rocket should hit this type of Jew but this type of Jew should be speared the Hamas didn't care if the rocket destroys a Ger Chassid or a secular left-wing liberal open-minded Israeli who may call himself an absolute atheist or agnostic. The Yisrael who, the Mishpacha, the family, always remains intact, always remains powerful. This is what a community is. This is what a shul is. This is what base Torah is. Not just a synagogue, a temple, a home. What's the definition of home? You know what they say about the definition of home? The place that when you come there, they gotta let you in. <laughs> you come to a certain yeshiva, what are your credentials? Why are you here? You come home, what is your mother gonna say? It's not your house. If she's a mother, she lets me in. <laughs> it's my home. Base Torah. There are shuls that are shuls. There are shuls that are shuls and also homes. Yaakov Kore Bayis, right? The Gemara says, Avram called it a mountain, Yitzchak called it a field, Yaakov called it a home. Bayis. A mountain, you got to climb up very high to get there. Field completely open. A home is a unique place. Has that combination of privacy, it's a sacred space, a sacred confined space, but it's a home. When I come, they let me in because I'm a member, because I'm a child of that home. There's something else, my dear friends, about your community. And I quote here a teaching I heard directly from the former where I was in the airport. And uh, leaving the airport, who do I meet? We're both walking out from the airport. I meet the former chief rabbi of Israel, Rabbi Yisrael Meir Lau. When his predecessor became the first chief rabbi of Israel, Rabbi Avraham Yitzchok Hakoyen Kuk. And where Rav Kook was coronated as his, in his position as the Ashkenazic chief rabbi of what was then called Eretz Yisrael, Palestine, under the British mandate. Rav Kook said the following insight. 
The Navi Yeshaya says, we say this in the Aftaris before Rosh Hashanah, I think he saw it. As he describes the Acharis Hayyam in the end of days, he's going to look at the children of Israel coming back. Mi'ela ka'ov tu'ufena v'chayoynim el arubo yuseyem. Who are these people flying like the clouds and like doves returning to their dove coats? Why this redundancy? They're coming back to Israel like the clouds and like doves flying back to their nests, to their dove coats. So Rav Kuk, Rav Avram, Yitzhak HaKoyen Kuk said, and he said this eerily, A decade before the Second World War, before the Holocaust, he said, there are two types of Jews who come back to Israel for very different reasons. It's a difference between the clouds and the doves. You ever saw a cloud? What moves the cloud? The wind. How fast does a cloud move? If there's a thunderstorm, if there's a stormy weather and the winds are powerful, a cloud could fly up to 100 miles per hour. Or 50 miles per hour, sometimes 20 miles per hour. But what's guiding the cloud? The cloud is being pushed by a force outside of it that drives it in a particular direction. It's not being compelled to travel there by conviction or faith or passion. It's being compelled to move as a result of the stormy weather. What about a dove? Why does a dove go back to the dove cult? Because of love, because of romance, because it wants to go home. Rav Cook said, Jews are gonna to come to Israel for two different reasons. There will be those driven by the, like the clouds, the hatred in other countries will be so powerful. They won't have a choice. They'll go to the place where you have to let them in. But he says Jews should go to Eretz Yisrael like doves who are in love. Einecha yoinim. Who want to go back home. And Rev Lau says, says, you know why I came to Eretz Yisrael? I was a cloud. I was in Buchenwald. My father was gassed in Treblinka. My mother was murdered. My brother was gassed. Where should I go? To Pietrikov? Where should I go? I was a clown. I was a six-year-old boy. Where should I go? I went to the one home that the Jewish people have. I was a clown. A six-year-old clown. He says, today, I see Jews who are comfortable in America. They go to Eretz Yisrael. I say, where do you go? America is a very nice country. Baruch Hashem. He says, we're doves. They're doves. They want a deeper divine connection. They want a deeper spiritual life. He says, wow, that's another level, another madrega. This is very different, he says, to two generations. I had no choice. I mamish had no choice. I had no other place. Because there are two types of Jews. There are Jews who are told they're Jews. They're told by the anti-Semites that they're Jews, and we have a lot of them today. And sometimes they wake up too late, and then there are Jews who are not clouds, they're doves. They're guided by an inner compass, an inner passion, an inner conviction. They know who they are, what they represent, what their, where their authentic homeland is, and why they were sent to the world as God's people, the Sakin Oilam, the Malchus Shindalad Yud, to repair the world under the kingdom of heaven. There was a bar mitzvah boy. He had to give a speech at his bar mitzvah. Came to his mother and he says, I want to speak about our ancestry. Where do we come from? Mother says, where we come from? God created the world, created Adam and Eve and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and that's where we come from. Comes to his father. His father was a graduate of Columbia University. He says, Daddy, what's our ancestry? Daddy says, it's been 15.3 billion years. The homo sapiens have evolved from our brothers and sisters, from our cousins, chimpanzees, the great apes, the gorillas, the monkeys, and they, other primates. How did it begin, Daddy? It began with some prebiotic cholent or soup. 
gases, bacteria, helium, hydrogen. Comes back to his mother, says, Mommy, I'm confused about the speech. I want to speak about an our ancestry. You tell me it's God, Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah. Daddy tells me it's monkeys and apes and chimpanzees and gas and bacteria. Can you tell me, Mommy, who's right? Where do we come from? Mother looks at him and says, Son, there's no contradiction. Your father was talking about his side of the family. Yeah. I'm talking about my side of the family. There's two ways of looking at ourselves. There's two ways of looking at our children. There's two ways of looking at every single person. I can look at a person and say, I can look at myself, I'm just a random mutation, a random blimp on the surface of infinity with no beginning, no end, all meaningless and valueless. Or I could see myself and understand that I, we, were conceived in love. There is destiny, there is vision. Same is true with the Jewish people, the Jewish purpose, the Jewish destiny. People are today alarmed about the ugly resurrection of ancient hatred, the most ancient hatred in the world. Jews in America always felt safe are alarmed, are scared, and there's good reasons for it. We have seen an outburst of Jew hatred that there was a shame to speak this way just a few years ago. Many Jews scratched their heads. What is going on? How can this happen in the United States of America? That's only if you're like a cloud. If a person understands the story of the Jewish people, the destiny of the Jewish people, the mission of the Jewish people, not to be reactive, but to be proactive. Understand that in every generation we somehow were chosen to be the miners' canaries, to stand in the eye of the storm, at the vortex of civilization, in the center of the world as the interlacing link between earth, as God's ambassadors to the world. And nobody likes their alarm clock. When my alarm clock rings in the morning, I press snooze. Jews were chosen to be the alarm clock of the world. You don't like your alarm clock. It's hard to listen to your chauffeur. This is a community that doesn't only speak about Eretz Yisrael in abstract terms. I have to say, friends, and maybe it's not politically correct, but I anyway get in trouble. I am very hurt when I sometimes meet our brothers and sisters who speak about Avas Yisrael and Avas HaToyre and Avas Hashem, and yet sometimes can behave towards a soldier in the land of Israel in such a rude fashion. I cannot fathom it. I cannot comprehend it. Here is a boy who's standing on the front lines protecting you so that you could sit and steig in Torah and Yerushalayim. Say, thank you. Buy him a Strauss ice cream. Give him a hug. Doesn't mean you have to agree about everything. Doesn't mean there's no problem. Doesn't mean there's no challenges. But you speak about Hakoros HaToyv, gratitude, thank you. Go over and say, thank you. Surrounded by millions of enemies who want every Jew dead, religious, secular alike. Meir Sha'arim b'nei brak Tel Aviv chayf atzvas. Herzliya and Gula alike. Say thank you. Respect, the love, camaraderie. Gam yochad, gam yesh chiluk edayis. It's still shevesach and gam yochad. Well, this is a community that speaks and teaches and inculcates Jews with a love of their identity, a love of their faith, their conviction, their history, and their homeland, and their brothers and sisters here and in our homeland, all one. And at last, my dear friends, I believe, forgive me if I'm mistaken, that as it's always in history, the eyes of the world again are on the Jewish people. It's been that way since Abraham. But Jews have to become aware of it. And I have to tell you something. I grew up in Brooklyn. 
There was the principal of Beis Yaakov in Borough Park. His name was Yossel Goldstein, Olav Shalom. We called him Uncle Yossi. Why? Because as far as I know, he directed every children's Jewish rally in Brooklyn since the days of Jefferson. And Uncle Yossi, Yossel Goldstein, composed a song. He composed it. I'm not going to tell you that the lyrics match the Beatles or Bob Dylan. But these were Uncle Yossi's lyrics that we heard from the age of two. And it went like this. Hashem is here, Hashem is there, Hashem is truly everywhere. And then we all had to take our index finger and go up, up, down, down, right, left, and all around. Here, there, and everywhere. That's where he can be found. Okay, don't worry, I won't quit my day job. <laughs> You're looking at me, the guy, he decided he's a singer. There was a fellow, he came to a rov, and he said, I need a job. The rabbi says, and he offers. He says, yeah, I could become a singer or a dancer. Which one? He says, become a dancer. He says, Rabbi, why you saw me dance? He says, no, but I heard you sing. <laughs> In any case, we had to pick up our index finger. Hashem is here, that's right. Up, up. Two Shabbosim ago, Uncle Yossi's son, Rabbi Yisrael Goldstein, from Chabad at Poway, his index finger was blown off by the murderer, by the terrorist who came into shul right before Yisker, Shabbos, Acher, and Shal Pesach. And people don't realize his rifle jammed after he murdered Lori Kay, but there were 50 unused bullets in that rifle, plus many more loads of ammo that he had on him. Because he wanted every Jew in the shul dead, which would include 40 children. And what could have been, heaven forbid, a bloodbath. And yet, one Jew, as we know, was murdered, three wounded, including the rabbi whose index finger was blown off, and another finger dangling, which they saved after hours of surgery. But I have to say, there was a moment of an extraordinary Kiddush Hashem, what happened in the following days. The media, the President of the United States, couldn't get enough of this rabbi. What was he saying? What was he saying? He rose up, to the position of a Jew who knows why he's here in the world as an ambassador of love, light, hope, morality, ethics, justice, education and the values upon which God wanted us to build civilization Lashevis Yitzhara and you saw the president himself and much of the media couldn't get enough of a Jew who speaks with dignity with clarity, with pride, with a sense of vision and morality, what a Jew is, what's the role of a Jew, and not little clay shteteldik and narrow, narrow Judaism that belongs in a ghetto, but Judaism with a vision for the world. Speak about public schools, a moment of silence, that the children in America need values, values, values. Education is not only about information, it's about creating a mensch. It's about creating Children who feel responsible to be kind. That's what God wants more than anything else. And you saw how the world ate it up. And it reminded me, I was in Detroit for a Shabbos, Partners in Torah, and I was sitting near famous Jewish activist, leader, philanthropist in Detroit. His name is Gary Turgo. And Gary tells me during lunch, Rabbi Jacobson, I was once sitting with Margaret, Margaret Thatcher. You remember Margaret Thatcher? Longest Prime Minister of Great Britain, they called her the Iron Lady for good reason. And I say, I say, Ms. Thatcher, what was your most awkward, embarrassing moment as Prime Minister of Britain? She says, without skipping a beat, she says, I'll tell you, every Tuesday, the Prime Minister has a private audience with the Queen. 6 o'clock p.m. you go to Buckingham Palace, you brief the Queen over the events of the week. Margaret Thatcher said, one Tuesday, 6 o'clock, I enter into Buckingham Palace. I take a look at the Queen, I give the traditional bow, and then the greatest nightmare falls in front of my eyes. And the men will not understand this, but the women will. Thank you so much. The greatest nightmare, what is it? Same exact outfit.
Men, you'll ask your wives after dinner and she will explain it to you. If you haven't figured it out after 40 years of I cannot help you, but there are good therapists in months. Here. The same, but not the same, the same! I can't say anything that's going to be more embarrassing. We have the meeting. I am awkward, dread, I'm dreading it, I'm hating every moment. I bow, I leave. The first thing is, I send a note apologizing. A note. Your Majesty, I apologize. I didn't know what Your Majesty was planning to wear. And henceforth, I instructed my team that every week they let me know before what the attire of Her Majesty shall be so I could make sure to dress appropriately and honorably in respect to Her Majesty. And I truly apologize for the mistake. Margaret Thatcher is expecting a note back. Yeah, no, you know, no big deal, it happens, Shy next. Margaret Thatcher responds, no need to apologize. The queen never notices what commoners wear. <laughs> I like this story, not only because it's a good story about Buckingham Palace, but I think there's a profound lesson. When we speak about mamleches koyanim v'goy kadosh, what it means to be a queen, what it means to be a king. To be able to know who you are and not get affected. And notice those who distract, those who ridicule, those who mock, those who make fun. And tonight, all of us, not just the people here, but Klal Yisrael really, because we're all connected, celebrate the 43rd dinner of an institution that nurtured, nurtures and will nurture. I think these three components, number one, of true Jewish unity, anachnu mishpacha shalom, family. Number two, a sense not of being compelled, but a sense of vision, not being clouds sent to Israel, but doves who appreciate their home, appreciate their identity, appreciate what it means to be a Jew with inner conviction, gusto, and oomph and true passion and love. And number three, to train generations of Jews who understand that our role is not just to be insulated, but that to be able to serve as moral teachers and role models, each one of us with our capacity to the world at large to inculcate our youth with a mission that is large and infinite and broad to have an impact not only in my little corner begins with my little corner but far and wide and today I and we wish all of you the Rav, the Rebetzin, the leaders of the community, the board, the Gaboyim, the Shamashim and of course the great honorees all homegrown potatoes and tomatoes from within and all of you pillars, supporters, worshippers, men, women, young and even younger, who are here to make sure that this great institution not only survives but thrives and goes from strength to strength with tremendous hatzlacha, chazak, chazak, venis chazek. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you.